Hey, and welcome back. Thank you for giving me some more of your time. Last video, I cited research that indicated that religious people tend on average to have lower rates of depression, anxiety, and substance abuse problems. They're less likely to attempt and commit suicide. And they tend to on average live about four years longer while also generally reporting being happier than non-religious people. So a response I got uh, probably three, four times on Reddit uh, was a good one. It's, um, you know, but what about all the, about how, how so many of the happiest places on earth are the least religious? So people were referring mainly to uh, the Scandinavian and a few other Northern European countries. So I wanted to look into this. And so let's do that. So people often cite how Scandinavian and some other Northern European countries like Switzerland and the Netherlands, for example, are remarkably less religious and also more happy than most other nations. So let's start off by looking into, are they actually less religious? Yes. Uh, I did some research into this, and while nominal religious identification in countries like Sweden, Finland, Switzerland, and Norway and Iceland constitutes strong majorities, the only exception in the countries that rank among the highest of these countries in happiness was the Netherlands, and they had just slightly under 50% identified as religious. So, yeah, a healthy majority, a strong majority of the people in these countries are identifying as religious. However, religious participation is much lower than these numbers would suggest. In Sweden, for example, up until just a few decades ago, newborn Swedes were automatically assigned to the Church of Sweden. Um, and so this itself is going to beef up their numbers of apparently religious people huge. And... It makes sense then that the rates of atheism in Sweden are far higher than you would expect if 65% of its people were actually uh, religious. In Iceland, um, where 90% of people identify as having a religion, only 2% say that they regularly attend church services, religious services. In the U.S., um, the, the rate is 38% report going to church uh, weekly. Um, the other countries I'm discussing here, you know, Iceland, uh, Switzerland, uh, Denmark, uh, the, North, the Scandinavian countries and so forth, their rates of religious attendance go from 10 to 29 percent for either weekly or monthly attendance. So far less than what you would see in the United States. And furthermore, majorities in all of these countries say that religion is not important to them. I'm citing a lot of research here. Check the box below and you'll see a whole bunch of citations that you can check out if you like. But yes, they are less religious. So now let's get to the question are, of are they actually happier? So I'm going to have some criticisms here. I'm going to start off by talking about one of the major studies um, that people cite. And so in the study, or in, in an article describing the study, it is said, uh, to determine the world's happiest country, researchers analyzed comprehensive Gallup polling data from 149 countries for the past three years, specifically monitoring performance in six particular categories, gross domestic pro product per capita, social support, health, uh, healthy life expectancy, freedom to make your own life choices, generosity of the population, and perceptions of internal and external corruption levels. Based on these criteria, Finland took top honors, as they have for four consecutive years, maybe five. Um, and then next in line, uh, and this is for all countries, like, you know, 139 or whatever I said countries they're considering. Number one, Finland. Uh, number two, Denmark. Number three, Switzerland. Number four, Iceland. Then the Netherlands. Then Norway. And then Sweden. Um, so they pretty much, uh, they either had all or most of like, you know, the top seven or so spots um, from this type of survey. They've had similar results in, in similar kinds of studies. So there's the, also there is the, the Bhutan Gross National Happiness Index. Uh, which attempts to sort of assess, uh, you know, collective happiness. 
Um, and so it, it, and it uses as input to their calculations the following four factors. One, sustainable and equitable socioeconomic development. Two, environmental conservation. Three, preservation and promotion of culture. And four, good governance. So this kind of study, like the, the, the Bhutan version of the index, also favors these Scandinavian and Northern European uh, countries. But there's lots of criticisms that I could offer. You know, one is uh, that critics have pointed out that the difference between evaluations and experiences of well-being, um, or sorry, I should say they have pointed to these. So for example, uh, in Colombia, Colombia was ranked 37th in the 2018 World Happiness Report ranking, but first by Daily Emotional Experience in Gallup's Positive Experience Index. So vastly different results based on how the study was conducted and what was being looked into specifically. Which leads me to the next criticism. The Both of the things we just talked about above, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the attempts to measure happiness, they're not actually measuring happiness, right? They're measuring things that may well be correlated with happiness and well-being, but they're not synonymous with it. And so one could ask, you know, why wasn't things like rate of psychiatric medication use or um, use of psychological services or rates of suicide and self-harm or addiction rates or criminality rates considered? Like those would also be good things to look at when you're trying to figure out how, you know, kind of happy the people are. And you could also just simply ask people to rate their happiness like zero to 10, uh, which sounds like it's kind of what Gallup did with their positive experience index. And so based on these criticisms, I, I, I started looking around for some other indicators of well-being and not well-being and happiness and unhappiness. So I looked up uh, suicide rates by country. Um, there was 183 countries included in this ranking. Um, and we're going from the least amount of suicides. So like the number one ranked country would be the one with the fewest suicides all the way to 183 that has the most. The highest ranked country of all of these Northern European countries that we're talking about here was Denmark at 74th. So the best that any of them did was finish middle of the pack, you know, on the, on the, on, on the upper end of the middle of the pack. Finland was then all the way back to 146th. So like they're like probably back in like the last quartile. So, and all others were in between with an average ranking of, um, well, yeah, I got the math wrong here, but yeah, somewhere in the middle uh, between those numbers. And so, yeah, the average ranking of uh, about, a, uh, they had an average ranking if you um, across the countries of about 118th. So collectively, if they were one country, they'd be at the bottom 36th percentile for least amount of suicides. Then I looked at depression by country. Um, this uh, was a study done of 179 countries. And we, I will go over the results right now. So what was found was that Finland, out of these 179 countries, had the seventh highest rate of depression. The best of the entire group was Iceland at 119th. So it's on the good side of the middle of the pack. The average ranking was 55th out of 179 countries. And in this case, the closer you get to one, the worse you are. So they're basically, you know, probably somewhere like in the bottom 30th percentile or so. So not doing too great. And of course, these are complex considerations, right? Like, so it's like I, a really good uh, guaranteed contributing factor to this is the lack of sunshine received up in those areas. Like uh, I had seasonal affective disorder back in Canada. I used a special lamp for it. Now, I, the biggest reason I moved to Arizona, it's because it's literally the sunniest place on earth or it's three and a half hours away from the sunniest place on earth. So I know how powerful that can be. But having said that, it still does seem to be very questionable to call these countries the happiest on earth. It's at best, it's questionable. Then let's briefly go back to the issue of religiosity. So I, I looked up who are the top 10 least religious countries in the world. In order, they are as follows. The, the country that is the least religious in the world is the Czech Republic, followed by North Korea, then Estonia, then Japan, Hong Kong, China as a whole, South Korea, Latvia, the Netherlands, and Uruguay. 
So only one of the countries from uh, the countries that we're talking about that are allegedly among the least religious in the world made this top 10 list, and they were one removed from the bottom. And just looking at the rest of that list, it's like not really any of these other countries except for the Netherlands are, are, are countries that are known for having happy people. It's often, you know, people expect the exact opposite of that. But let's, for the sake of argument, assume that Swedes, Norwegians, Icelanders, Finns, the Swiss, and so forth actually are more happy than uh, people in most other countries, generally speaking. Could anything, like what kind of things could contribute to this? Well, one would be the, the high degree of ethnic homogeneity, uh, which ranges from 75% to 98% of the people in all these countries having at least one parent, usually two, that are from the, that country's ethnic majority. And now this is not like a xenophobic rant I'm about to go on. Research has shown that trust is negatively correlated with ethnic diversity. And if you think about it just briefly, it makes very good evolutionary sense. Like just as street cats tend to run away from people they don't know, so too are we more nervous around those that are less familiar to us. Like if they have radically different facial structure, skin tone, and so forth, you know, like they probably share far fewer genes with us and we just don't know them. Right. And especially in historic times when there was like linguistic, uh, either an absence of language or just uh, linguistic barriers, it, it made it even harder to establish bonds. And this is not a, a situation unique to Western nations. Like if a million Americans were to suddenly move to South Korea, their their culture would be disrupted and affected. And I, I think you can expect that the level of trust in society would go down just because there's a whole bunch of these relatively unfamiliar outsiders suddenly here in relative there in relatively large numbers. And relatedly, trust and social cohesion are high in the countries that we're discussing. However, social cohesion is being viewed by some as being at risk in Sweden and the reasons they cite. And this is the uh, Open Society Foundation. I think this is, a, I, think, I believe that's George Soros, isn't it? Um, um, they, they find that, uh, that social, social cohesion in Sweden is increasingly at risk and they cite rising inequality, economic inequality, and rising ethnic diversity as likely top tier contributing factors to this. So next, let's move on to economic inequality, since I just alluded to it. All of the countries that we're talking about here, you know, Switzerland, Iceland, all of them, they are all wealthy social democracies, which allow for notably less economic inequality than, for example, the United States. So uh, a major measure of this is called the Gini coefficient. Uh, it's a measure of economic inequality uh, ranging from 0% to 100%. 0% refers to what would be a country that was perfectly equal like everyone had literally exactly the same uh, a, a Gini coefficient of 100% refers to maximal inequality so this would be a country where where one person has everything and everyone else has nothing um, in a study uh, 169 countries were included and the countries that we're talking about here all did very very well in terms of um they were, they had among the least economic inequality. Uh, so you can like judge that. I, I should take away the well, but just, the, yeah, they, they were among the least unequal. So let's look at it. Iceland uh, was the 10th most like economically equal country considered out of 169, I think I said. Uh, then Denmark, Finland, and Norway were 13th, 14th, and 15th, respectively. Then there was the Netherlands at 21st, Sweden at, the, at 23rd, and Switzerland at 50, uh, 53rd. If you combine them all, they have an average ranking of 21st out of 169. And further, these are all wealthy nations, so it's not like they're simply equal because they're all broke. And as research that I that I post in the box below uh, will show you, uh, it has been found that level of income inequality in a society is positive cor positively correlated with risk for mental illness and is negatively correlated with social cohesion. Moving on to the next relevant um, consideration as to why these countries may be happier. They are all geographic geographically small. So even if people were to move to another part of the country, they're still pretty close to the place they grew up, to their friends, to their family, and so forth. 
this is going to be a big boon to keeping communities intact, even if a person has to leave to go to a different part of the country for work or school or for whatever else. And then lastly, these countries are, they're all in Europe. So they have like dozens of, of countries very nearby that are not their own. And so they get way more exposure than most people do to people outside of their in-group. And I think it's pretty obvious that, you know, if you're just in your in-group and everyone there is in your in-group and no one that's there is not, you might even forget that the in-group exists. Like it becomes the most noticeable when you start seeing people outside of the in-group. And that's why you'll see things like, like, like school spirit. School spirit, like it's pretty much not there unless we're talking about some kind of interaction with another school, maybe a sporting competition or, or something like that. Um, and then like nationalism, for example, like that plays up big time during wars and during like Olympic games, like, like it, it kind of requires us to like consider the nation, not just by itself, but in reference to other nations. And it's, it's like from my own personal experience, like, um, you know, like my name on YouTube is Ron from Toronto. If I was still in Toronto, I wouldn't have made that name. It's like, I think it's because I'm down in Arizona. So I'm surrounded by people that are not in my in-group that makes me feel more proud of my in-group and more celebratory of it. So just a little anecdote right there. So there's lots of reasons then, uh, why I could cite for, um, you know, these other countries being, if they're more happy, here's some reasons why. They have all sorts of things that are going to contribute to things like social cohesion and trust, which are very important to happiness. Um, you know, like the, pres the preservation of community, which is huge. And so let's put it all together. So just wrapping it up, the countries that we've been discussing are less, less religious than most. There are countries that are even less religious, however, than these countries, and most of these countries do not seem to be particularly happy places. So, as and no one is so as nobody is suggesting, it's not like irreligion causes happiness. I don't think anyone's saying that. Next, it is unclear if people in these Scandinavian and Northern European countries actually are happier. They might be, but I think it's murky. And if they are not happier, this is probably due at least in part to the lack of sunshine uh, they are exposed to, which is a big deal. And if they are actually happier, that could probably be attributed in good part to the social cohesion and trust that comes from living in a geographically small country with an overwhelming native majority, controlled wealth inequality, and frequent interactions with outgroups, which can increase one's sense of connection to their own in-groups. What does this afford the people of countries like Denmark? Well, I would say it, it, it affords them real, enduring, intersupportive communities based on ideals and values that transcend the self. For example, the value of, you know, national Danish values and the esteem and preservation of uh, Sweden and so forth. And this represents a very good chunk of what I claim religion provides. Like what I've been saying is they provide it deep, enduring, intersupportive community um, where there are ideals that people remind each other of virtues and wisdom regularly and encourage them to employ it in their own life. And they, they regularly remind themselves to uphold ideals that go beyond their, you know, each person's individual self-interest. Uh, and so, and, and part of that is just preserving the integrity of the religious community. Um, so a lot of that is, seems to be at play, uh, in these smaller countries that we're talking about here. And so just like the university community, as I argued in a recent video where I was trying to talk about why, um, atheism is overrepresented in universities, perhaps part of the reason for that, uh, with the university stu uh, students, faculty, and so forth, is that they already have a community that, and, and this community has its own lofty ideals and so forth. And, you know, they have, they get a sense of purpose and all that. So they, they, they already have a lot of what, uh, religion would provide them, making them probably less hungry for it because they're already getting it. And I think you could say the same thing about, uh, these Scandinavian and Northern European countries, whereas countries like the U S and Canada, where people move way more often and when they, and they move further and so forth, um, where, um, there's less people that, that actually stay where they were from. And there's more people coming from other countries and stuff like that. There's going to be less harmony on average, more distrust and less well-integrated, well-preserved communities. And so I think, 
that kind of shed some light on um, why if these Scandinavian countries, despite their lack of religion, if they're still if they're more happy, we've got some very good reasons why. And it's basically because their countries afford them much of what religion affords other people. Thank you.